today, we will be talking about glycolysis, and we're just going to be focusing on the first part of glycolysis, right, which is just the anaerobic conditions. Um, the TCA cycle is a different chapter, and that focuses on the uh, aerobic conditions of which we can create ATP. Right now, we're just focusing on creating ATP from an anaerobic environment, meaning no, uh, no oxygen around us. Right. So where does glycolysis, you know, where, where does it occur? Well, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. So we can say that glycolysis, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. So here's the cell. And within the cell is the cytoplasm or the jelly, right? And we're going to be making pyruvate in the jelly, right? Because glycolysis, all that it's doing is that it's converting glucose into pyruvate. So glycolysis converts, converts glucose molecules into pyruvate. As you can see here, glucose enters the cell, it's going to be phosphorylated so it stays in the cell, and then it's going to do a series of reactions uh, to create pyruvate. Now it looks simple here, you go from point A to point B, but there's a lot of steps and we're going to be covering those steps in this video, right? It's like uh, driving from, you know, what state you're in to Washington. Oh, it looks simple, but you're going to have to go through different states, different highways, different streets to get to Washington, right? So it's the same way for glycolysis. What do we use in glycolysis? Well, to do glycolysis, you're going to need the following. You'll need a glucose molecule, so we're going to say glucose, two ATP, plus two NAD plus, and that's going to be really important. That's actually a cofactor, right? So this is an essential cofactor um, right there. And then we're also going to need two phosphate groups. And that's going to come from the ATP, as you'll see. Okay. Now, what are we going to get out of this? Well, in the end, we're going to get two pyruvates. Two pyruvates. Um, so in some textbooks, they'll say you get four ATP. Some textbooks say that you'll get two ATP. Well, here's the deal. Yes, you do get four ATP out of this reaction, but initially you used two ATP. So four ATP, right, is what we're going to get out of this reaction, minus the initial ATP that you put in to do the reaction, gives you a net total of two ATP generated. Okay, so in this equation, we're going to say that we make two ATP, okay, that, that um, it, it was a net profit, right? So out of this whole reaction, we get two ATP, okay? Two ATP, uh, two NADH, okay? Uh, plus two hydrogens, which is important too. And then we also get some waters, right? So we get two waters. So we get a lot of products out of this reaction. Is this reaction efficient? Not really, because you only generated two extra ATP in the end, and you did so much work, it's not very efficient. What is efficient is this process right here. See, the anaerobic, the okay, so this portion right here is called the anaerobic pathway. And therefore, it means that we can create pyruvate without using oxygen. The downside is that you take a lot of energy to do this, and you don't really generate too much ATP. It's not economical. What is economical is the oxidative uh, pathway. So we can say that this is the aerobic pathway. And we're not going to be covering this uh, pathway in this video but it would uh, take the pyruvates that we make and convert a lot of ATP, okay? So now I'm going to clear the screen and we're going to go into detail. So there are three pathways for pyruvate. After we make pyruvate, you have the option to do the following. 
Now, we can actually add oxygen in the mitochondria with pyruvate to create more ATP. And this is going to be called the aerobic pathway. So this is the aerobic, aerobic pathway. It takes the product that we make in glycolysis, the pyruvate, and creates ATP via oxidative processes. Um, another way is that pyruvate is going to be converted into lactic acid. Now, whenever you're exercising or running, uh, specifically running, um, you have this burning sensation building up in your thighs. And that burning sensation is actually lactic acid. It's a very acidic uh, compound in your body. And essentially, it's using pyruvate in an aerobic uh, pathway. So, uh, excuse me, anaerobic pathway. So this is anaerobic pathway. And essentially, it's when you're holding your breath and you're running. It's, don't do that, by the way. Um, essentially, you're creating pyruvate into lactic acid for quick and inefficient ATP generation. So this is an efficient way of getting ATP. Uh, also, in yeast, uh, we exploit this, right? So yeast, they live in a solution, probably of sugar and some other stuff. And they convert the sugars to glucose into uh, pyruvate and then pyruvate into ethyl alcohol. Here's a fun fact, actually. So goldfish, the little goldfish you keep in your, in your uh, bowl, can actually generate alcohol. And the reason why they don't, you know, drink the alcohol or they're, they're not drunk is because the alcohol disperses throughout the water. But since their little body is always moving, they're generating pyruvate and there's not a lot of oxygen in the water, so that pyruvate is converted into ethanol. So that's why we often change the water for our goldfish, or we at least have a filter in the aquarium, okay? Because you don't want to have a lot of alcohol where your fish are. Um, so glycolysis is actually, uh, it's, it's actually a reversible process, okay? So glycolysis, we can say that glycolysis is a reversible process. Why is that? Well, after you're done exercising, you feel really sore. And that's because your muscles have a buildup of lactic acid, right? So that's why sometimes when uh, you finish running, let's say three miles, your legs hurt and it's hard to walk the next day. However, if you uh, rest for three to four days, usually that pain goes away and you can run again, right? So that's actually the lactic acid uh, converting back into pyruvate and then the pyruvate converting back into the glucose molecules. So pyruvate can go back to, uh, excuse me, to glucose. So pyruvate, pyruvate can go back into glucose. Okay, so that is one of the uh, reversible processes in glycolysis. And here's another fun fact for you. Um, so the reason why turtles can swim for miles and miles underwater and not come up for air is because they are constantly creating lactic acid. Their, mu their muscles build up in lactic acid and the calcium in their shells actually acts as a buffer for the uh, lactic acid because calcium in, in their shells is slightly basic and lactic acid is slightly acidic so it kind of evens out and it allows them to swim for miles um, in the water. So that's pretty cool, and that's one of the reasons why glycolysis is very applicable to organisms across the world. So glycolysis can actually be separated into two parts, and we're going to be covering this whole schematic in this video, so it's very fun. Anyways, so this part right here, this first part, is called the investment phase. And it's called the investment phase because you use 2 ATP to generate glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So we can say that it uses, uses uh, 2 ATP. So we're going to put in some energy to create a molecule. So it uses 2 ATP to create, create 2 glyceraldehyde. Three phosphate. Now, in the second phase, 
In the second phase, we're going to be creating a different molecule. In the second phase, we're going to call this the dividend phase. So divid, divid end. Right, and this comes from a stock um, vocabulary. So we invested something, and then we're going to take that investment and kind of create new products from it. We're going to create more energy from this. Right, so that is the dividend phase. The dividend phase takes the two glyceraldehyde three phosphates and creates pyruvate, and that is the ultimate uh, product that we want to make. Okay, so notice that G three P glyceraldehyde three phosphate goes through a different set of reactions and gives you two pyruvates. Okay, so this creates creates um, two pyruvates. from what? From the two, and we're just going to call glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate G3P, we're going to call that, uh, from the two G3Ps. Okay, So it's not that bad of a reaction. Uh, again, it's very inefficient, but we're going to be uh, going over them in detail. So to recap, the investment phase is just where you put in energy to create a product. You're actually priming the reactions, right? We're putting everything into motion in the investment, in, sorry, in the investment phase. And then in the dividend phase, we're going to take whatever we made and create the final product. And so over here, we can say uses, uses two ATP. And then the dividend phase uh, gives, gives, for ATP. Now, the total ATP that we make is only two, okay? So I know you see, oh, we made four ATP, so the answer is four. No, in the end, four ATP produced minus the two ATP initially gives you a net reaction of two ATP. We will now begin our descent into the glycolysis metabolic pathway. So if you remember from the carbohydrate video, and that was the last video, so you should remember, is that we count our sugars with this carbon. So this is the anomeric carbon. So we start counting from here. We go one, two, three, uh, four, five, and then six over here. Now, the first step is to phosphorylate glucose into six phosphates. So we're gonna be making glucose six phosphate. Why do we do that? Well, we phosphorylate glucose so that it can't escape the cell, right? So again, here's our glucose molecule. It goes into our cell. We're going to phosphorylate it, and then it's going to stay inside the cell and be able to do the reactions. If we do not phosphorylate it, glucose is just gonna go zip right through the cell, and we don't want that, so we're gonna be trapping it, okay? How do we trap it? Well, we're gonna be using hex kinase. So uh, use, use hex, hexokinase, hexokinase. Now, when you're studying, hexo just means six, and glucose is a six carbon sugar, and kinase, well kinase, it just means that it's an enzyme that phosphorylates. So kinase is an enzyme that uses ATP to uh, get the phosphate group and attach the phosphate group into so we can say that kinase, right, it can uh, use PI, so PI is just a phosphate group, this guy right here, use PI to attach, attach to uh, molecules. So literally it says attach phosphate group to six uh, carbons, okay, so that's what we're doing. Now this step right here is actually regulated. So this is a regulated, so this is a regulated, regulates um, pyruvate, or excuse me, uh, glyco glucose, right? So regulates glucose uh, six phosphate. However, this is reversible, so a reversible. So for instance, if your body sees oh, we have too much ATP, we don't need to do glycolysis right now. So I'm gonna take this product, glucose 6-phosphate, and I'm just gonna use it for a different pathway. Or it can say, well, I don't need this product anymore, so I'm just gonna convert it back into glucose. Okay, so this step right here, the first step, is not permanent.
Okay, not permanent. So this is not permanent. Okay, so to recap, we get our glucose, we're gonna be using hexokinase to phosphorylate it. And we phosphorylate it because we don't want it to be leaving the cell. Okay, we want the glucose to stay inside the cell to you know, do reactions, okay? And of course, literally, we are just adding a phosphate group to the sixth carbon. So adds phosphate group to six carbons. Adds phosphate group to sixth carbon. But to do this, where did the phosphate group come from? Well, if you were very, very clever, and if you saw literally this one right here, you would say, oh, Brian, we got the phosphate group from ATP. You're right. Hexokinase actually snipped with its little microscopic scissors a phosphate group from the ATP. Okay, so literally this is the first investment uh, step. So this is the first, first investment step. Okay, because it used one molecule of ATP to create adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and um, we used that phosphate group to attach it to the sixth carbon. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, and six. So here's an open chained uh, structure, and then there's the closed chain structure, also known as a Haworth structure, and just for people who like seeing uh, both structures, right? So sometimes people might see that this is more simpler to understand. I get it. So yeah, that's the first step. The second step in the um, glycolysis metabolic pathway is that we are going to be converting, we're going to be converting uh, glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. Now, what's the difference between glucose and fructose? Well, the difference right here is that this is an aldehyde. Or you can say aldose, right? So we can say aldose. Um, so we have aldose. And this right here is a ketose. Or you can say ketone. So all we're doing is that we're going to be playing Legos. We're going to be moving carbons around and some hydrogens. And we're going to be converting that aldehyde functional group into a ketone functional group. So what enzyme is going to help us out with this? Hmm. So here's an easy way to remember. So literally, what are we working with? We're working with phosphate. We have glucose. OK, so what if we use phospho, phospho, glucose. Now, what are we trying to do? We're trying to play Legos with some uh, sugars. So whenever you change the structure, but you have uh, the equal amounts of carbon, hydrogen, oxygens as you did before, that's going to be called an isomerase. Okay, so we're gonna be using isomerase right here. So this is uh, isomerase. Okay, so an isomerase is just creating a new molecule without removing anything. We just moved carbons around, we just moved hydrogens around, that's it. They have the same molecular formula, right? They have equal amounts of carbons, equal amounts of hydrogens, equal amounts of oxygens. So that is an isomerase. Specifically, we'll be using glucose 6-phosphate isomerase, okay? Uh, it's a type of phosphoglucose isomerase. So that's the family. So that's the family right here. The specific enzyme that we'll be using is called um, glucose. Glucose 6-phosphate, very literal, right? Isomerase. Now here is the open chained form right here. So we have the aldehyde is going to react with glucose 6-phosphate isomerase and is going to convert into a ketone. So really, it's just uh, these three carbons, or excuse me, these two carbons converting into a ketone and then everything else stays the same, okay? So this is not a permanent reaction. This can be reversible, okay? So we can say that this is not regulated so your body isn't saying, okay, well, how much fructose do I have? How much uh, G6P uh, do we have? No, it's not saying that. It's just going to be doing the reaction, right? So it's not regulated and can be reversed. Can be reversed. Okay. So we can convert fructose or fructose into glucose 6 uh, excuse me, 6-phosphate. And as you can see, we did not use ATP. 
So we said that this is no ATP used. Now, first step three, we will be converting fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-biphosphate. So just looking at this, right? So we have fruct fructose, fructose 6-phosphate. Um, And we're going to be converting it into what? Into what? Fructose 1, 6 biphosphate. So without looking at anything else, what are we doing? Well, I kept the fructose the same, but notice that I'm going to be adding one more phosphate group. Well, we had one phosphate group right here, but now we have two because bi means two, right? So where are we going to put that other phosphate group on the fructose? Oh, look at that. How convenient. We're going to put it on the first carbon. Where is the first carbon? Right here. Again, this is not complicated. One, two, three, four. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, uh, five. Right here. Right. Excuse me. Actually... It's not complicated, but it is hard to tell the carbon. So since it's a ketone, you have to remember that. One, two, three, uh, four, five, and six, right? So again, we're going to be adding another phosphate group to the uh, first carbon, which is the anomeric carbon. How do we do that? We're going to be using a kinase enzyme again, specifically the phosphor fructose kinase. Okay, so we're going to be using a kinase enzyme. Okay, so it's the same thing as the first step. Same as first step. Same as uh, first step. Okay, not complicated. Now here's the open chain. Here's our ketose group. Let's go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, well, the uh, kinase enzyme is going to take away this oxygen and add a uh, phosphate group on it. Excuse me, it's going to take away the hydrogen and add a phosphate group on it. So look at what happened here. We added another phosphate group on the first carbon. Now where does that phosphate group come from? That's right, it comes from the ATP molecule. So this is the second, this is the second um, investment step. Okay. So we use another ATP to get that phosphate group. The kinase uh, grabs the phosphate group and puts it on the first carbon on the fructose molecule. And that gives us fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Now, this step is permanent. Okay, Why is it permanent? We'll look at Gibbs free energy. Now, Gibbs is negative 14.2 kilojoules per mole. Now, that's a very, very negative uh, delta G value. Now because the delta G value is so negative, the product wants to form. Okay, So because we want to form that product, we're going to keep it in that way. So uh, because delta G is negative, so because uh, delta G is really negative, and we're going to say uh, negative right here, this step is permanent. And so, uh, does the body regulate this? Yeah, it does. It says, well, I don't want to make too much product if I don't need it, right? So I'm only going to make this if I need to make ATP, if I need to do uh, the, the metabolic pathway. If I don't need to do it, I'm not going to make product because if I do it, I can't change the product back, right? So it's like cooking, um, uh, or I guess it's like a putting toast in a toaster, right? If you don't want to eat the toast, don't put it in the toaster because once it comes out, you're not going to be able to untoast it. Now, this is step four. In step four, we're going to be trying uh, to convert the defructose 1,6-biphosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And uh, if you remember from the beginning of the video, that's what we want to make in the first part. We want to make two uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. Okay. So how do we do that? Well, we need to cut some bonds. So what enzyme allows us to cut bonds? 
Well, I know that the family of enzymes that allows us to cut bonds are called lysases. Okay, so that's what they're called, right? And we know that lyse means cut and aces means enzymes. So these enzymes are gonna cut something. Now, what specific enzyme do we need? Well, we're gonna need an, aldil, um, an aldase, right? So al, aldolase right here, okay? And that uh, enzyme is going to be cutting this uh, bond right here. Why that bond? Well, remember, we want to make glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And so I'm going to need to cut this six-membered uh, molecule into three carbons. So we go uh, one, two, and three. So right here is where I'm going to do the cutting. Now, are we using ATP? No. Are we using water? No. So we can say that this is a non-hydrolytic cleavage reaction. This is a non-hydrolytic cleavage reaction. So non-hydrolytic cleavage reaction. We didn't use water to do this, okay? So now that my little enzyme has chewed through this bond, you know, it's had its dinner, it's a good enzyme, we have glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is good. And then we also have dihydroxy, well, excuse me, we have dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which in this context is uh, junk. So this is junk right here. And uh, the second step, actually the fir uh, fifth step, is trying to convert the dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So how are we going to do that? Step five is the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Because remember in the previous step, step four, we made dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. But we want to convert this guy, DHAP, into another G3P. So to do that, we're going to use an isomerase enzyme. Specifically, we use a triose phosphate isomerase. So we use enzyme, uh, enzyme, the triose, triose phosphate isomerase. Right? Because look, dihydroxyacetone phosphate actually has three carbons already. Right? It has three carbons, one, two, three. And the product that we want to make also has three carbons. So one, two, and three. So all we need to do is play Legos, move some hydrogens around, move some oxygens, move some carbons, and we got G3P. Right? So that's all that happens. Over here in the overall molecule right here, so the uh, open chain structure, we created uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and also a dry, uh, excuse me, a dihydroxyacetone phosphate. So step five is just converting this guy into that guy. And we do that using the triose phosphate isomerase. So that is all for the uh, first half of glycolysis. So you're literally halfway done with glycolysis, right? We finish the investment phase. And now we have to talk about the dividend phase. But before we do that, let's do a recap of what happened. So the overall reaction is that you used one glucose, so we use one glucose, one glucose, you used two ATP, and from those molecules, you created two uh, G3Ps, G3Ps, uh, you also created uh, two ADPs, excuse me, ADPs right here, okay? So that's what you created. And we also used up two phosphate uh, groups to do phosphorylation reactions, okay? So now you uh, have two glyceraldehyde three phosphate groups, or excuse me, three phosphate molecules, and we're gonna be doing uh, the dividend reactions. This is going to be step six, and step six is part of the uh, dividend stage of glycolysis. So this is part of the dividend uh, stage of glycolysis. Okay, so step six, we just made G3P. We made glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now we are going to make 1,3-bi-phosphoglycerate. 
okay, well, what does that mean? Well, if you just look at this word, there is a uh, phosphate group on the third carbon, and then there's a phosphate group on the first carbon. If you look at this name right here, we have a phosphate group on the third carbon. Well, what is the difference between this name and that name? Well, right here we have biphosphate, meaning that there are going to be two phosphate groups, and then that phosphate group is going to be on the first carbon. So literally this reaction is just going to be adding a phosphate group to the first carbon. Now you're probably wondering, okay, well, you know, we're going to need a kinase. Not necessarily. Uh, kinase does not work in this case, right? It's going to be a bit more complicated. Uh, we're going to be using a family of enzymes that are called oxy, uh, excuse me, oxidoreductases. So they're called oxidoreductases. Okay, and this uh, family of enzymes, they can make NADH, they can make uh, FADH2, and they can also make they can also make NADPH. But in this reaction, we're going to be making NADH. Okay, so what enzyme from this family will help us out? Well, we're going to be using uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So uh, for time-saving purposes, we're just going to put G3P, G3P uh, dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase. So what does that mean? Literally, it's, it means dehydrogen, the mo molecule. Okay, so this enzyme, ACE, is going to take away a hydrogen from the molecule and put a phosphate group on it. Which hydrogen do we mess with? Well, we go one, two, three. Okay, so I'm gonna be adding a phosphate group to the first carbon. That carbon has a hydrogen. I'm gonna take this guy out. He is going to uh, bond with NAD, okay? Because this is a hydride ion. So he's gonna bond with NAD, and they're gonna live happily ever after. And then we're gonna use the enzyme to take out this phosphate group from the hydrogen and it's going to attack, it's going to attack this carbon, okay? And so this hydrogen is just gonna be floating in solution and you see that right there, okay? So all we did was that we added a phosphate group to the first carbon in G3P and we made 1,3-biphosphoglycerate, okay? So, and we used the uh, G3P dehydrogenase enzyme to do that. And right here, we actually did what? we actually reduced NAD. So over here we say this is a reduction reaction. Reduction reaction. Because we reduced, reduced NAD plus, this is a, a D right here, NAD into NADH. Right, so reduced is a gain of electrons. Technically the hydride ion is an electron. It's weird. Right? So we reduce NAD to NADH. Right? How many did we create? Well, since we had uh, two uh, G3Ps, because you know in the first part we make two molecules as G3P, we're going to be making two molecules of 1,2-biphosphoglycerate, two NADHs, and two hydrogens. Okay? Uh, another way you can think of it is that you have glucose is going to do the investment phase, and you're going to get two G3Ps. And then those two G3Ps are going to do reactions, right? So everything you see here, you multiply it by two. So this makes uh, two, one, three uh, biphosphoglycerate. Okay? And it also makes two NADH2. Or, excuse me. Two NADH and then two hydrogens. In step seven, what are we going to do? We're going to be converting 1,3-biphosphoglycerate into 3-phosphoglycerate. So what changed? Well, notice that we don't have a, bif a, a biphosphate group anymore. We don't have two phosphate groups on the molecule. We only have one phosphate group. So what happened? Hmm. Well, what happened was is that we, we used an enzyme. So the enzyme that we used was called phospho, 
phosphoglycerate kinase. Okay. Now, if you're studying uh, for exams or for medical exams, you should know or you should have noticed that the enzymes are often related to the molecule names, right? So what are we working with? We're, we are working with phosphoglycerate. Okay, so we're gonna be using a kinase that works with phosphoglycerate. So phosphoglycerate kinase. Now kinase, they phosphorylate groups, so they add a phosphate group. But kinases also take phosphate groups away from different molecules, right? So the kinase took away a phosphate group from the ATP. Well, the kinase can also take away the phosphate group from a molecule. Specifically, it's gonna take the phosphate group from this guy, okay? So the enzyme takes away this phosphate group right here, and it's going to make a connection between the phosphate group and the ADP. Now, ADP, when it's connected with a phosphate group, forms ATP. And so, therefore, we actually make ATP. So this is a very exciting step. Okay, so um, that's pretty uh, exciting. Of course, this is called a transferase, transferase uh, reaction, because uh, you're actually transferring a phosphate group somewhere. Okay, so there you go. Of course, we have two molecules of 1,3 biphosphoglycerate. Therefore, we need two ADPs, and then we make two, three, phosphoglycerates and we also make two ATPs. So you can tell that we already uh, made enough ATPs to be neutral, right? Because in the beginning, in the investment phase, we invested two ATPs. Here, we already paid off that investment. So the ATPs that we generate in the next steps are gonna be uh, profit ATPs, okay? So that's kind of like the net gain of ATPs. In the eighth step, we use uh, two phosphoglycerates and we're going to convert it into two two phosphoglycerates okay so what's the difference well the difference is just the placement of the phosphate group so instead of having the phosphate group on the third carbon you're going to have it on the second carbon now notice that we still have three carbons on the left and on the right side and we also have equal amounts of hydrogens so go one two three four one, two, three, four. So all we did was play Legos again. So what kind of reaction is this? It's just a rearrangement reaction, okay? So we're gonna be using a family of enzymes that rearranges, and we're gonna call those isomers. I, I, I guess uh, isomerase, excuse me, isomerase. So isomerase, right? Specifically, what enzyme from that family are we gonna use? Well, we're gonna be using phospho, okay? Because we're moving a phosphate group for what molecule? Glycerate. So we're gonna put gl uh, glyso, or glycero, and then, uh, because scientists think it's really cool, we're gonna call it mutase, mutase. So put it all together, we have phosphoglyceromutase, okay? And mutase just means to change, so to change right here. Did we use any ATP? No. Did we reduce anything? No. So all we're doing is just moving around phosphate groups and hydrogens. So again, you can call this a rearrangement reaction or you could call this a mutase reaction. Depending if you're a nerd or a geek or something, you could call this a mutase reaction. It sounds cooler. This is step nine. In step nine, we're gonna be converting uh, two phosphoglycerate into phosphoenol pyruvate. So you should be really excited that we're almost uh, forming pyruvate. Um, we just need to get rid of the phosphoenol, right? But before we can do that, we have to convert it from the two phosphoglycerate. Well, how do we do that? Well, notice that we have a highlighted hydrogen and a highlighted alcohol. Together, they make water. So whenever I do this reaction, I'm going to be uh, dehydrating the molecule. So this is kind of a dehydration reaction right here. So this is a dehydration 
dehydration reaction. What helps us do that? Well, what helps us do that is an enzyme uh, called the enolase. So the enzyme used is called enolase. And you should know that whenever you're using enolase, you're going to be dehydrating something, right? So it's going to cleave off some hydrogens and an alcohol. Now, is this a hydrolytic cleavage? Do we use water to cut something? No, we use an enzyme. So this family, uh, the family that it belongs to, is the lysase family. Okay, so enolase is a type of lysase. Right, lysis are just enzymes that cut something. So we react two phosphoglycerates with enolase. We form a water molecule, and then uh, we just form the phosphoenol pyruvate. Okay, so that's all that happens. Right, you just take out the water. It's going to make a double bond right there, and that's it. That's called an enolate. So of course this isn't really complicated. Did we uh, generate any ATP? No. Did we uh, oxidize something? Did we make NADH? No. All we did was that we cut some water out, we dehydrated the molecule, we formed a double bond, and that's it. Now, in the last step, right, finally, we will convert two phosphoenol pyruvates into two pyruvates. We will generate to ATP, right? And we are going to be using two hydrogens and two ADPs, right? So how do we do that? Well, let's look at the molecule first. We have three carbons. Pyruvate also has three carbons. Did anything change? Well, this guy didn't change, so it's not important right now, right? However, we took out a phosphate group. Do we have any enzymes that do that? If you look over here, <laughs> you should know that we're going to be using a kinase because kinase can either insert a phosphate group or they can take out a phosphate group. Here we're going to be taking out this phosphate group. Okay, So we're going to be using pyruvate kinase. So pyruvate ruvate kinase. Right. Okay, so that happens. And uh, this is called a group transfer reaction, also known as a transferase. So we can just say transfer reaction. And this uh, enzyme belongs to a family of enzymes called a transferase. Transferases. Right? Okay. So it removes the phosphate group from the second carbon. So we go one, two, and three, right? Now, since that comes out, it's going to bond, actually. It's, uh, it's going to bond with uh, adenodiphosphate, adenosine diphosphate. And then this hydrogen is actually going to come over here. And it's going to uh, bond with this carbon, right? Of course, uh, throughout the whole reaction, we have two PEPs. And then we're going to be making two pyruvates, right? So there you go. This step is highly, highly regulated, okay? It's highly regulated because the delta G, the standard uh, free entropy, is very low, okay? So this is regulated step. Regulated step, and it's also permanent. Another word that you can see for per permanent is irreversible. Okay, so this is a irreversible reaction. Now that is step 10, that is the last reaction, right? So you have one glucose, it goes through the investment reactions and then it goes through the uh, dividend reactions just to make two pyruvates, right? So again, uh, glucose, so we're gonna put glucose, uh, goes through the investment phase to make two uh, glyceraldehyde uh, three phosphates, right? So G3Ps, and then is going to make two pyruvates, and then two ATP, right? So this is the net profit. 
Of course, this is very inefficient. You did so much work for so little, but this is under anaerobic conditions. Meaning that there's no oxygen in the cell. Only when it gets to the mitochondria do we introduce oxygen to the pyruvates and we make a lot more ATP. Right? So again, this is a permanent uh, step. It's highly regulated. Your body doesn't want to do it unless it needs to. Uh, and we know that because the delta G for this reaction is very, very negative. Negative 31.7 kilojoules per mole. Okay, So you can typically uh, tell if a reaction is permanent by looking at the delta G. Now, throughout uh, the video, you're hearing me saying uh, this is a regulatory step. This is uh, not regulated. This is permanent. This is reversible, etc. Why did I mention that? Well, I mentioned that because your body has kind of inhibition feedback pathways, right? So, for instance, um, uh, step one, two, 1, 3, and 10. So, steps um, 1, 3, and 10. They're regulated, and therefore uh, we have two, four through nine. Uh, they're not regulated. Why is that? Well, steps one, three, and ten. The delta G value. The delta G value is really negative. Okay, so this is negative, and then the delta G values for step two four through nine, well, the delta G is, we can consider it zero, right? And so it's neutral. You know, there isn't a gain or a loss in enthalpy, or entropy, excuse me. So what does that mean? It means that those steps are reversible. And whenever delta G is so negative, you want to form the product. The product looks so good. Pyruvate is so good. So we want to make uh, pyruvate in step 10. We're not going to undo it, right? It's like uh, making cake, right? So we have our flour, sugar, our uh, honey, or whatever. And, you know, if we open a bag of sugar and pour it out, well, we can reverse it, right? We can put the sugar in the bowl back into the bag, and we can close the bag. Good. But if we mix our ingredients together and then shove it in the oven, well, we're going to make a cake. Can I undo the cake? Can I, you know, take the sugar out of the cake and put it back in the back? No. I mean, it would be really cool. I would get a lot of money if I could do that, but I can't. Nobody can do that. Because the product, in the end, the cake, is so favorable. We want to make the cake. Why would I want to undo it? It's impossible. And so the delta G for steps 1, 3, and 10 are going to be very negative and irreversible. Therefore, they are regulated. Do I want to make this cake? Should I? Uh, do I have enough time? What about the calories? You know, it's regulated. My body wants to know, should I do this before I commit to it, right? Okay, so for step one, uh, specifically uh, regulator, uh, regulatory steps, the hexokinase, the hexo, hexokinase, actually regulates how much glucose stays in the cell, right? So we could say regulates regulates uh, amount of glucose glucose that stays in the cell. Right, so let's say that we want five glucose molecules in the cell. Well, hexokinase is going to phosphorylate meaning it's going to put a phosphate group onto five glucose molecules. You know, if it sees more glucose, it's going to say, well, you know, I, I just needed five. I don't want to have more. So those glucose molecules are just going to go in the cell and then come out the cell. I'm not going to put a phosphate group on it. So we can say that hexokinase regulates the amount of glucose that stays inside the cell, right? So that's why we regulate it. And um, it also has like a feedback inhibition uh, pathway. So meaning that the product is going to uh, prohibit the hexokinase, right? So a hexokinase, let's call that H, it's going to phosphorylate a glucose. So we're just going to put PG for phosphorylated glucose. You know, and then the product, the product is going to say, well, I exist. And therefore, I'm going to stop you from making any more products, right? You already have me. 
why would you want to make more product? So we can say that the glucose 6-phosphate blocks more product formation, right? Because if it didn't, hexokinase would just keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it, right? So we need a uh, feedback inhibition pathway, right? Um, ultimately, this regulates how much pyruvate you're going to make, right? We know that one glucose molecule makes two pyruvates. So if hexokinase decides to phosphorylate five glucose molecules, ultimately you're going to have 10 uh, pyruvates, right? So, yeah. Now, step three, we're going to be dealing with phosphofructokinase, uh, right? And um, it's one of the key steps in glycolysis. It's really important. Now, the question is, why is phosphate fructokinase, we're going to call that PFK, why is that so important? Well, it's so important and so regulated. This is uh, step three. Because it is the first part of the reaction that is irreversible. So it is irreversible. Okay. So it is irreversible, and once you make it, you can't go back. Right, uh, because the uh, delta G is going to be really negative. Right, so what does that mean? It means that whenever ATP is high, so ATP, so let's put if, if ATP is high, then we're not going to make PFK. I mean, the whole purpose of glycolysis is to make pyruvate, and pyruvate will then enter the mitochondria in the aerobic pathway to make more ATP. So if there is already a lot of ATP, why should I make PFK? I don't need to make pyruvate anymore. I have enough energy, right? So if I if the energy ATP is high, then we don't need to make uh, we don't need to make phosphate fructokinase, right? And uh, speaking about the mitochondria. Whenever the pyruvate enters the mitochondria, it's going to make citrate, okay? So um, the aerobic capacity, or, or sorry, the aerobic pathway, gives citrate. Now citrate is essentially the uh, physiological form of you know, citric acid, right? So whenever you eat an orange, or something that has a lot of vitamin C in it, uh, that goes into your body and it's converted into citrate. Now, citrate is only converted through the aerobic pathway. So if you have a lot of citrate, you're doing a lot of ATP generation. If you're doing a lot of ATP generation, then you have a lot of energy and you don't need to make PFK. So it's citrate, if high, then uh, no PFK. Right, so we can tell that we're regulating PFK a lot. I mean, this is one regulate. Um, sorry, this is one regulation, and then this is another regulation, right? So, um, what activates PFK? Well, of course, it's like uh, it's hard to explain. But um, if you have a lot of AMP, so if lots of AMP, so adenosine monophosphate than uh, low ATP, right? Because ATP is going to keep reacting and reacting and reacting. And then as, as it keeps reacting, you're going to be losing phosphate groups, right? So ATP reacts, it makes adenosine diphosphate. When adenosine diphosphate reacts, it's going to make adenosine monophosphate. So eventually, we're going to get to a point where we have a lot of AMP. And that means that we have low amounts, low amounts of ATP. If the ATP is low, then the body senses it and it's going to say, okay, well, I don't have enough energy, so I'm going to make more PFK. And that PFK is going to make pyruvate and is going to gen generate some more ATP. Okay, so we're going to say that low ATP makes uh, PFK. Also, the uh, fourth one, the last one really, if your body senses that there's uh, a lot of sugar in your blood, so if your body senses a high glucose level in your blood, it's going to say, well, I have a lot of glucose in the blood, and I have to convert that glucose into a different form. I'm going to convert it, and then um, 
I'm going to follow the steps of glycolysis and I'm going to convert it into uh, phosphate fructokinase, right? Because we don't want to have a high level of sugar in our blood, right? That's going to be uh, toxic. So uh, if, if high glucose level in blood, then uh, PFK increases. Now, the way body uh, regulates ATP in step 10, so we're going to say step 10, the way the body regulates the formation of pyruvate from uh, PEP is that it's going to, um, well, essentially it's going to sense the amount of ATP in the body, right? Everything boils down to ATP. So if, if high ATP... then we're going to have low amounts of uh, pyruvate formation. Right. So why is this important? Your body uses red blood cells to deliver oxygen, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious. And I like the example of comparing red blood cells to buses, right? So your body is a city, and your red blood cells are buses, and they're going to be transporting people, in this case, oxygen, to different parts of the city, the buildings or organs, right? So in order to do this, the red blood cells need constant ATP. In order for the buses to deliver the people, it needs constant uh, fuel of gasoline. So the gasoline is going to be our ATP. If the, if the uh, bus doesn't get gasoline, it's going to break down and it's not going to operate. Likewise, if the red blood cells don't get ATP, they're going to burst, literally burst, right? So uh, red blood cells, red blood cells need constant ATP. If they don't have ATP, they are going to burst, and we actually call that process. Um, we actually call that process hemolysis. You know, if no ATP, cell burst, and we call that hemolysis. Let's uh, fix that M. And so, what does this depend on? The red blood cells depend on glycolysis, so they depend on a glycolysis. Because ultimately, glycolysis creates pyruvate. That pyruvate will go into the mitochondria. The mitochondria will generate ATP. So technically, the red blood cells depend on glycolysis to generate ATP, right? So uh, yeah. Why should we care about hemolysis? Well, hemolysis, that leads to uh, hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic anemia. So now you have a less amount of red blood cells in your body. Those blood cells cannot deliver oxygen to different parts of the body, and you feel faint, or you start changing color, right? You, you look more pale. So uh, hemolytic anemia is very um, very severe case of having hemolysis, you know, it, it takes a lot of transfusions, a lot of treatments, and it never really recovers. So that does affect our daily lives, okay? So, um, yeah, uh, if you want a fun fact, the second most common form of hemolytic anemia is due to the deficiency of pyruvate kinase. So if you're not generating pyruvate, right, if you don't have pyruvate kinase, you're not making pyruvate. And if you're not making pyruvate, you're not making ATP. And so it is actually the deficiency of pyruvate kinase that leads to uh, hemolytic anemia. So on the exam, if you see that, what leads to a hemolytic anemia, you can say that it is the deficiency of pyruvate kinase. And so finally, here are all the steps of glycolysis put on one slide. So you can refer back to it, uh, see the different structural changes, right? And then um, I guess you can...
you know, pretend which enzyme occurs between these guys, right? Um, but the main reason that I brought this up is because I want to explain to you why the body does glycolysis in the first place, aside from ATP production. Why? Why do we convert glucose into pyruvate? I mean, you know, what's the reason? Well, the reason why is because glucose has a higher energy level, right? So this is a high energy level. Let's say, let's make up a number, right? Let's say that thermodynamically, it's going to be positive, I don't know, 100. Let's just say positive 100. Well, as it does, the reaction is going to be lowering the delta G, okay? So this is unfavorable. We don't want to have just glucose floating around the body because it has a high amount of energy. The universe is lazy. It's going to take reactions at a high energy level and convert them into you know, uh, negative energy levels, right? So it's going to reduce the amount of energy. So it's going to do reactions after reactions after reactions. Let's say that this one over here is going to have a delta G of about, let's say, 2, right? Let's just make up a number. So that is more favorable than this guy, right? Now it's going to do reactions after reactions, and then finally it's going to get to this guy. And this guy right here is going to have a delta G, a delta G of about negative, let's say, 32. Right, it's around that uh, ballpark. Right, so we have delta G, and let's say that it's negative 32 kilojoules per mole. So notice that pyruvate has a lower energy, has a lower uh, Gibbs free energy than glucose, and so that is the reason why this reaction goes into completion in the first place. Is because the products, in the end have a smaller amount of free energy than the reactants, right? So that concludes glycolysis. I hope that you understand how to, uh, you know, differentiate between the different molecules, which enzymes are used, which family enzymes are being used, when they're used, why we do it, right? So hopefully you do well on your exam. Don't look at this and say, oh, I can't memorize this, I can't do this. Just go one step at a time, you know? How do you eat the Empire State Building? One bite at a time. It's not complicated. A lot of these enzymes can be derived from the names. You can look at the names and see or imagine which structures are being changed. Where did we put the phosphate? Oh, we put the phosphate over here. Well, that's a isomerase. Oh, that's a kinase. That's a transferase reaction, etc. It's not difficult. So hopefully this video helped you out and I hope you do well on your exams. Thank you so much for watching this video and spending time with me. I love you and have a great day. Thank you.